Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be discussing uh, an introductory workflow for RoadEng uh, software to allow you to do rural road design. If you haven't been to a webinar before, my name is Erin. I am one of the main webinar presenters here at Softree uh, and with me is our uh, one of our resident webinar uh, core presenters, uh, Matthew Dickey. So today we're going to be discussing actually not one but two workflows for RoadEng. Um, the first is going to be a conventional workflow for leveraging the software. Uh, and then the second, we're going to kind of repeat the whole process to help you see some of those steps again, but also let you see the impact um, of adding some of the optimization steps uh, that you can do to just help with efficiency as well as earthwork cost savings. So if you're not too familiar with RoadEng, uh, RoadEng is a geometric uh, corridor design software. Uh, it's a standalone program. There's no CAD software needed, uh, but it is modular. So there's two modules inside of RoadEng that we're going to take a look at today. The first of those modules is the terrain module. This is where we build our surfaces for our original ground. Uh, and if you're also doing some things like site design, uh, grading, that's a great place to do it. Uh, but then from the terrain, we're going to head over into the location module, and that's really our specialized module for corridor design. It's all about linear infrastructure. Uh, we're also, as I said, going to be doing sort of two workflows. So we're going to take a look as well at the workflow that leverages RoadEng with Softree Optimal, so it's an add-on to the software. Um, and here it really adds two main things, uh, the first of which is Path Explorer within the terrain module. So if you're working on a greenfield project or uh, a major realignment, Path Explorer can be a really valuable tool just to help you understand where the most optimal routes are and it does it really quickly. Um, and then from there, we'll also take a look at uh, how you can leverage vertical optimization within that same workflow to really help you sort of automatically balance your mass haul, uh, generate really quick profiles, and then turn in a preliminary alignment into a horizontal alignment with curves exceptionally fast. So we're going to take, as I said, two workflows. Uh, let's discuss the first of those. So a conventional workflow in RoadEng. So you start by importing your topo data. This topo data can be in a variety of sources. Uh, it basically needs to be some type of yeah terrain, digital terrain data with elevations, elevations being the key piece. Uh, so we work with LIDAR, DEM, GeoTIFF, uh, con true conventional survey data from like a total station. And, uh, today's example uh, is going to be all about LIDAR, uh, just because it's really fun and easy to work with. But we do work with all those other sorts of data types. So in the core workflow, after you've imported your data, uh, you're going to create a TIN model. So a TIN model is basically just asking the software to connect all the survey points uh, with uh, a triangular irregular network. And that basically builds the surface. Uh, within that TIN model, for if you're working with conventional data like total station, you can define things like strings or break lines in order to influence how that TIN model looks. Uh, we typically don't do those types of steps inside of uh, working with LIDAR, but uh, they are there for, for working with conventional data. So with a TIN model created, we do have the ability to add within the terrain module itself, some additional spatial data that could be calculating your streams and ponds, that could be adding in a background ortho image, or you could import additional spatial data uh, in shape or KMZ format just to add and augment to your model. So from there, uh, we save that as a terrain file. So this is again, we're modular, so this is kind of module one. We've got our original ground. Then we move over to the location module where we're going to set up a new location file uh, and we're going to reference that topo surface that we just saved. So we're going to reference the terrain file. We'll set up our cross section template uh, and Matt will talk a little bit about this, but cross section templates, uh, you're not creating them from scratch for the most part, just leveraging the existing components, adjusting, you say, a road width or, or the, the different sort of elements within those little mini programs uh, to be the way that you'd like it. So we'll set up that cross-section template. We'll create our horizontal and our vertical alignments through clicking in IPs. We'll leverage the curve panels to add in our curves. 
manually balance our mass hull. So again, this is where we can take those alignments and make adjustments, especially in the profile, uh, in order to balance our mass hull and add culverts. Uh, and the final step from there is quantities and output. Now, this is a really simplistic workflow. We're just trying to give you the foundational understanding of how the software works. Uh, there's a lot more depth within it, uh, especially as we start to talk about things like ground types, uh, material movement, uh, we can go a lot deeper. But uh, from an initial workflow, uh, this is sort of the plan on a page of what we're gonna do. And with that, uh, I'm actually gonna transition it to Matt uh, as he gets it going here uh, to show us sort of our first initial conventional workflow. All right. And Matt, as we present to you, uh, a reminder to our audience, uh, please ask us questions anytime throughout the presentation, type them into the, the Q&A part of your GoToWebinar panel. We'll be happy to answer those at the end. And finally, uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, first off, feel free to like the video. And secondly, you can ask questions there too. Happy to answer them. Perfect. All right. Well, I'll dive right in and we'll go through that conventional workflow that Aaron introduced. Um, and as Aaron introduced, we're going to start in terrain. So just opening up the terrain module. Next, we're going to click insert file and bring in whatever survey data we have. So I'm going to just bring in my uh, LiDAR data. So we work with a, a bunch of different formats, but uh, this one's LAZ. So we're going to bring that in here. We're going to hit OK. And we can see that point cloud being added in. Now I'm just going to click off to the side so we don't have to wait for it to draw. Those points are still in our model. We can see we've got 2.6 million points. And we'll use those points to create our TIN. We'll go up here, we'll click generate. We have the option whether we generate contours at the same time or not. We will. And there's our contours. And we'll throw on the uh, 3D view here as well just to see what we're dealing with. Now, for this, it's optional, but I'd also like to add a little extra context. So I want to know where everything is. And we could bring in other spatial data if we'd like. But of course, grabbing a, an ortho image is a, a nice, easy way to get context for everything. So I'm going to click our home live or web mapping and then import button. So we've opened up live maps, select the area we'd like. I'm gonna just use imagery from Google, but we have other uh, map sources available there. And we'll download some imagery. And let's put that in the same location as where we're going to be working out of. And there we are. And another uh, optional item I want to do it though, uh, is uh, of course where the Water is is an important consideration. So we're going to use our hydrology tools. We're going to use our streams and ponds tool to generate a uh, bunch of well, streamed and pond features based off of uh, accumulated flow area. Uh, the ponding areas may not necessarily be true ponds, and it's just depressions where water is expected to to lie. So we've got our topo, we've got contours to add some context, we've got an ortho image, uh, we've got our streams and ponds, and keeping with that conventional workflow, we're gonna just save this. And we're gonna switch over to location.
All right, so I've opened up location. And click new. I'm going to reference that topo that we've just saved. And we'll hit OK. Now for this, I'm going to just start with a, a single point in the center of my terrain file. Uh, when we go through this with the, the optimal workflow, we're going to use a feature. But uh, in this case, we're going to just manually choose where we'd like to start and where we'd like to go. Here we are. So to start, we can see our topo file. Now that image that we've downloaded is a, a background image. So we're gonna add that in our plan view. So I'm just right clicking in my plan view, clicking plan options, and I'm gonna go into my backgrounds and I'm gonna click add. Next, uh, I'm going to want to set my cross-section geometry up to be well, representative of what I'd like most of my road to be. And uh, of course, we can change our, our cross-section geometries along the length of the road if we like. But uh, we're going to just get this set up to, to be what we'd like. So this uh, project that we're working on, it's an existing gravel road with some really tight corners with well, tight corners that aren't up to the design speed that we'd like to follow. So I'm going to keep it a gravel road. So we're going to just use our, our resource low volume road, which comes as one of the, the defaults. Uh, with this, we can pop this open. We can change our cross-section geometry if we'd like. So these are the template, cross-section template is made up of a series of components. And those components are basically a fillable form to change what we'd like. And we can see the effect of what we change in real time. So I'm content with uh, that as is. If we wanted something substantially different than this, we could go on the e-library that has a collection of other uh, template components in it. But again, I'm happy with this, so we're going to run with that. And we are going to assign that cross-section template. So we're not using our rural, we're going to use the resource low volume road. So we've gone to assign by range, click to add chose the one we want and click to add edit. And there we are. So we can see the, the difference. Next, we're going to start, uh, well, actually choosing our alignment. So I'm going to start out with my horizontal alignment. So I'm going to right click in the plan view, click add edit IP tool. We're going to go to our start point here. We'll grab that. We'll move over here. I want to start about there. And for this example, I want to and somewhere around here. And we can see everything's uh, linked right from the, the get-go. Now, of course, we're not going up and over the, the ridge quite like that. So we can pull it around. We can see how we're interacting with the surrounding terrain. Now I want to pull this over a little bit here. And we'll add in some curves. So I'm going to my curves panel. I can say, well, I want to add a circular curve. I'll hit apply. I'll go to the next one here. Same thing, only I'll make it a little bigger just for the sake of making it big. And again, everything updates in real time. And we'll pull this out that way a little bit. Add in another curve here. And we'll start doing the same to our vertical. So I'm going to go to my profile view, so my long section, click Add Edit. I'm going to add in a vertical IP at the end of my section that I'm realigning. We can pull this up. Now, this graph down here is my mass hall, so I'm keeping track of that as we go here. And I'm going to try to keep my grades under 12, and I'll add in some vertical curves here as we go. So, sure, let's set that.
and we'll set this one as well and set this one as well so we're not quite balancing we can make a couple tweaks here let's shift that that way we can move this out a little bit here if we'd like so we don't have to just balance with the the vertical we'll add a, a really subtle curve in the midst there and there we are now if we'd like we can go in here i'm going to add in a culvert so we'll throw a pipe in and i won't do all the potential pipes but we'll just use our culvert panel here to add in a pipe at that location and we can tweak how it's aligned if we like if we want to match the cross fall we can if we want to do something like change the ditch step create a, a sump there we can do that as well so pretty easy to use work with and uh, once we're happy with it well we can look at our volumes here so we're cutting uh, about 6600 cubic meters and we could switch over and produce our documentation or export this for construction staking. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll save the, the documentation for uh, our next example, because it is gonna be the same for, for both of them. And uh, we'll go with the uh, other tool here in a moment, but I'll let Aaron introduce it. Perfect, so that was uh, in about 10 minutes, I think really quick introduction to a basic rural road design workflow in RoadEng. Uh, so now we're going to take a look at that same project again, but insert uh, a couple of tools that, uh, that allow you to optimize it, uh, both in terms of time uh, for you as a designer, as well as uh, for earthwork costs. And hopefully my slides will advance here. So this is a, a quick look at an optimization workflow. So again, it's going to have a very similar start. We're going to import our topo data. We're going to create our tin surface. We're going to add in that additional spatial data, such as streams and ponds, um, as well as any other additional spatial data that you might have. Uh, but then instead of going straight and saving it into location, we're going to leverage a tool called Path Explorer. So Path Explorer allows you to set your start and your endpoint as a feature, uh, and then the software will actually look for route options that meet your design criteria, I should say high-level design criteria, such as your min-max grade, your max cut and fill, uh, your road width, your minimum horizontal radius, those types of constraints, uh, and it's going to look for the best routes between those two points uh, and then we can leverage those routes as the starting point when we go into location so we'll take that path explorer path we'll create that same new location file that references the topo exactly like matt just did we'll still set up that cross-section template but now we're going to start with a preliminary feature and we're going to use another tool inside the optimization toolkit that allows you to convert that path really quickly uh, from a polyline into a horizontal alignment with curves applied. From there, uh, again, another optimization step highlighted in this different green color. Uh, we're going to leverage vertical optimization to automatically generate our profile. So here we are taking a whole bunch of time saving shortcuts uh, that have a huge impact on our earthworks costs. So we'll generate our profile uh, and within that we previously were manually balancing the mass hall. Now it's actually going to automatically balance your mass hall as well. So it's going to look for a solution that balances your mass hall, assuming you want it balanced. <laughs> and Matt can probably address that part. Uh, but it'll generate a profile that minimizes costs, balances materials. You can review, fine tune, adjust your design, add culverts. Um, and then we'll get into that, what that output uh, looks like. It's very similar for both workflows moving into either multi-plot or having options to be able to export it to another design software to put it back into, say, a GIS platform. Uh, there's options there for that. 
And I should note uh, that this workflow, in addition to probably being faster than the, the eight minutes or 10 minutes that Matt just did, uh, it does also save tremendously in terms of cost. Uh, so you're looking at a reduction through just vertical optimization in the neighborhood of 10 to 30% on your subgrade construction costs. Because those little tiny adjustments to your vertical profile have a really big impact on cost when you add them up across the entire length of your alignment. Uh, and with that, my slides have advanced, and now it's uh, time to pass it back to Matt. We'll take a look at the second workflow. Perfect. All right, I will share my screen. And uh, we're gonna go right from scratch. Uh, so first thing to mention, if we wanted to do this after the fact and, and run it in our, our current file, we absolutely could, but uh, just to keep things nice and clear, on well, how does that workflow look like if I start my project with these tools, we are going to well, completely start from scratch. So once again, and uh, well, be a little less explanation for some of these things, but I'm gonna start in terrain. We are going to click insert file. So we're gonna grab that LAZ file. So we've got that, we're gonna create our uh, tin, also create our contours. We can add in that ortho if we'd like. And this time I'm gonna do something different just for the, the sake of it. So if we had our own high res ortho that we wanted to use, we could add it in as a, a background image here. So I've already got the uh, image saved out from before. So if that wasn't one that we just downloaded using live maps, well, we could uh, add it in this way instead. Got that. Uh, I'm gonna, I do wanna have my streams and ponds features here. Um, in this case, I want them, rather than just a visual aid to help me design manually, I'm gonna add some costs associated with these features. So we're gonna run that streams and ponds tool. And we are going to, uh, well, use that first tool in the optimization toolbox, and that is Path Explorer. So with Path Explorer, we want to tell the software, I want to go from point A to point B. So we could use a feature if we had a shape file or something, but in this case we don't. So I'm going to just draw in a feature. So and we'll get the kind of apples to apples side of it here. We want to go from there to there. So we're gonna configure this. So we want to, we'll go with the same design constraints that we used last time. So minimum radius of 100 meters. Uh, I'm gonna set my grades. We've got plus minus 12. Uh, for this, I wanna make sure my road starts being pointed in that direction and ends being pointed in that direction. So we're gonna control our approaches. And I've got my unit costs here, but I'm gonna add some construction zones. And in this case, the only construction zones I'm gonna add are those uh, streamed and ponds features. I'm just gonna say, well, other than just the cost of moving my dirt around here, we're gonna have extra costs for uh, those. But these uh, construction zone features are, are pretty flexible. So you can use them to, uh, well, account for all sorts of good stuff. So if there's an area that you don't wanna go, you can add them in as a, a no-go area. If there is uh, an area that's gonna cost more, you can add that. Um, if you wanna keep your uh, alignment within a, a feature or within a polygon, you can use a, a no-go polyline around the outside of your feature. But 
yeah, in this case, I'm going to keep it simple and just run with the, the streams, which I've said I have a, an average crossing cost of 2,500 bucks. So we are good to go. We'll hit OK. And it's going to think for a moment. So it's five, found five paths, still searching for what it thinks is the best solution given the parameters we've given it. And this is a great time to remind everyone, if you have a question, we are going to have lots of time today to be able to address them. So please, yeah, type your questions into that GoToWebinar question panel. You will remain anonymous. and We'd love to answer them. And yeah, this uh, is taking, shouldn't take too, too much longer here, but it is narrowing and exploring a bunch of uh, different solutions and now it's saying well unlikely to improve further so we'll hit cancel and there we are so we've got well five possible solutions if we want to see how they're ranked we can right click select feature by name and let's take a peek at this one here so that's our cheapest Just given the parameters that we've run, so 85 versus 94. We are going to save this file. I'll save it as something else just for the sake of having something else in there. Well, rather than uh, saving over the, the uh, train file that we just made and used and we're going to switch over to location now once again so again doing this from front to back uh, we could just add that into the, the previous example if if we wanted to but that front to back workflow, we're going to set this up. So in location, we're going to reference our train file. And here, now that we've got those other features that we'd like to use, rather than just starting with a, a single point, uh, I'm going to use well that Path Explorer feature there. Oh, some of this remains the same. We're going to add in our background. We're going to set our cross-section template to be what we'd like. Now, we've already talked about this. I know this is the one I want to use. I didn't even need to open that up. I could have just gone assign by range and put that in. So next, I'm going to run our polyline to alignment tool. So. This is a 3D polyline right now. We're going to switch it over to be a proper alignment. And we're going to just make a couple tweaks here. And this is one. We're going to just adjust our approach there. So we're going to add in an extra curve. So it was staying within that approach angle that we originally told it to, but we're going to tweak that. And then same with here, uh, I'm just going to well, adjust that to be a little closer to what I'd like. So I'm lining it up. And we can see what we're dealing with here. We can see while we're avoiding a lot of the, the gnarliness, 
um, but we're still going to want a proper alignment for our, our vertical. So we're going to come in here. We're going to tell this to sample. We'll set our design specs, which are already appropriate. We're going to add a control point at the start of the alignment. And we're going to add a control point at the end of our alignment. And we are going to click process and run our optimization. Um, now, one thing to note here too, if we wanted to, well, have a design that didn't balance. We could add pits and waste sites. Uh, we could add a, a bunch of constraints like well, full bench sections or minimum fill sections. But this one, we don't need any of that. We're gonna just keep it simple. So it's running through doing some sampling for us here. So there we are, and we've gone from having a, a project with our cuts in the 6600 range to, well, we're handy to that 4,000 uh, cubic meter range. Once again, we can add in our pipes, which is the, the same as what we did in, uh, uh, what we did in uh, the previous example, but here I'll do one more step, and we are going to add in our documentation. So I'll set my page size to be whatever I'd like. Uh, we could build these out from scratch or we can I'll say well I want to use this plan over profile. We can make adjustments if we have something like that where we've got a little bit of the road uh, moved off the alignment. So we've got our plan over profile. We're going to add in a another one with our Cross sections, and we'll configure this to control how frequently we're seeing those sections. So I want to go every 20 meters or anywhere that I've added a pipe. And there we are, and of course we can uh, export it to a bunch of different digital formats if we'd like. So save as, and change the extension to well, all sorts of different formats. So land XML. Uh, CSV, um, DWG, shape, etc. So pretty, pretty easy to use, pretty easy to run with, and uh, yeah, pretty fast and dynamic. And one thing I will just say here too is, of course, you're not stuck with any of this. If you decide, well, despite that being cheap solution, if I decide, well, I want to just raise this, oh, well, you can, and it's still dynamic, so you can. Go with a, a hybrid approach rather than just a, a conventional, purely conventional approach or purely a, a optimized approach. And with that, I think we've done something that doesn't happen very often. But uh, yeah, wrapping up before the uh, yeah, not going over. Awesome, and we've got a whole bunch of questions that we can start to tackle. So I'm just going to go from the uh, the top down. Um, the first question is, can you compare the two alignments, so the conventional one with the optimized one in the same project? All right, so first first answer to that is, well, yeah, we can have multiple instances of the, the software open, uh, but I'm going to just save this first one. And, uh, So we can click insert file and I do this, but we're going to get a top of does not match the current one. So we're going to do one more thing. So just we're going to switch the topo that we have referenced to match that 
one that the other one has referenced. And now when we click insert, we can see both alignments. We'll do a quick recost. So there we are. We've got that one versus that one. And one thing that I didn't mention, which is a, a useful thing for comparing, um, ground types, we can add costs associated with them. So I've got my uh, unit costs for different materials here, and I've got my movement costs. So I hit recost when I did my recalc, and now using those costs, we can compare the two alignments side by side, and I can see I'm, well, it's Earthworks, I'm basically cutting it in half. So yes, we can add them in and do that comparison side by side. Okay, awesome. Uh, let's keep going. Lots of questions to get through. Uh, our next question is, hi, how can we show elevation banding in profile? Uh, like a, a grid? Uh, we can go in here and we can turn on our, our grid lines if we'd like. Um, yeah, so we've got that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if that's what uh, you're, you're looking for there. We can also add, um, well, uh, we call them sub windows where we can add in uh, a bunch of different parameters. Um, I'll just kind of arbitrarily add something in here, but uh, let's do, sure, every 250 and we're going to add in L line, center line elevation. So there we are. So I've got to set all the, the start and zero and then uh, every 250. So we can add elevation data that way. Um, yeah, and uh, of course you can do it in the, the output sheets as well. We can do all sorts of uh, extra things with that. Uh, profile view and sub views to show super elevation diagrams, curve diagrams, etc. Um, so hopefully that answers your, your question. Awesome. The next question, uh, I'm going to use that super elevation as a nice segue into our next question, which is I have my own widening and super elevation tables. How can I get those into road inch? All right. Um, so let's ground here. Uh, so, uh, with that, my super elevation here is being uh, calculated, and well, I don't have widening being turned on, but I can turn it on, and we can have widening being uh, applied. Um, so, all of these well, uh, parameters down here, if we turn auto on, they can pull in information automatically uh, from a table. So we can go select table. So this is my super elevation table. I've got it defined where my uh, first column is my radius. Uh, first row is design speed. So we've got our design speed up here. And then it's calculating what the super elevation should be for that uh, curve. So same with transitions, etc. cetera. Um, all of these, we can just click open uh, the well, default uh, format is a, a TBL file. It'll also read in CSV, text, et cetera. Um, yeah, just as long as it follows the uh, same uh, formatting, which I mean is, is pretty uh, straightforward. Yeah. So you can okay. write <laughs> something in Excel and uh, bring it in easily. Excellent. Uh, let's keep going, Matt. I know we're four minutes to go, but still a huge list. So let's see if we can get through a few more. Um, the next question is, what is the longest path uh, that RoadEng can optimize between A and B? Um, so that is the 
Yeah, there's not a, a, a fixed answer to that. It depends on a bunch of things. Um, one is computing power. So uh, yeah, if you're running a, a supercomputer, you'll be able to solve bigger problems than uh, uh, what I can solve or someone using a, a just a standard laptop. Um, so that, that's one factor. Another one is complexity. So if you've got uh, a road to put through some really gnarly mountainous terrain, well, you're probably going to uh, have a, a smaller ceiling than someone putting something across the prairies. Uh, and then uh, resolution would be another thing. So just how detailed we're looking at it. So if you want to go really big, um, you could uh, reduce the resolution. And with that, it's going to probably reduce the, the solution quality a bit. Uh, but you can go with a kind of a tiered approach where you start out with fairly uh, coarse uh, example and then use that as a, a starting point to feed it in with a higher or, or more uh, detailed data as you figure out where, what areas are, are worth pursuing. Um, yeah, all that being said, we just ran one the other day that uh, was fairly large. Aaron, do you happen to remember the, the length of that one? 180 kilometers? Yeah. yeah, I think it was straight line 180. So, um, yeah, don't, that's that's on the aggressive end of things for sure. Um, and it really does uh, depend a lot on the uh, what's going into the problem. Yeah, sounds like we've got an opportunity though for a, a workflow video for really long paths in terms of adjusting the resolution. So we'll, we'll definitely put that on our follow-up list. Uh, that particular question had a second part, which was uh, how does it work uh, from A to multiple wind turbine locations? Can it do it simultaneously? We're looking at a complex road network. All right, so the... Uh, uh, of course, I opened the, the wrong one here. Um, but uh, short answer is it won't do it simultaneously. Um, if we want to go kind of A to B to C or A to B and C and D, uh, it's going to be a, a matter of kind of doing those solves uh, individually. The premise of it though is, oh, again, pretty straightforward. Um, we just need a feature. So to C, we'll say in this case. So if we want to go from there to over here, uh, well, we can run that. So one, we don't want to remove those uh, existing points that we have. And then two, we're going to want to hem in our uh, well, start direction. And in this case, it just so happens to uh, well, work out that it's the same as last time where we want to make sure it starts out pointing in that same direction that we're ending from our previous run and away we go. So yeah, pretty pretty straightforward. We do, we do have a video showing how to how to tackle that, but uh, yeah, pretty pretty manageable. Okay, let's do another Path Explorer question while we've got the terrain window open. Uh, with Path Explorer, can you provide any options that are off spec in the case that it doesn't find any options? Um, so I guess, uh, and I might not be completely uh, following, but one thing that happens uh, when we run this uh, is it does a, a feasibility check really quickly. So if it's identified that, well, it's not a, a feasible problem, you don't have to wait for uh, minutes uh, for that to, to come back, that it's not going to work, and then you can uh, relax your constraints. So with that, the uh, design parameters that we have in here are uh, firm, but we can do a sensitivity analysis. We can adjust things to uh, loosen those uh, parameters if if something that we're, we're looking at isn't uh, isn't feasible. Uh, another thing that we can do uh, related to construction zones, if we put in a, a big no-go area and it was kind of, well, I really don't want to go there, but if I have to, I can figure out a way to do it. Um, uh, a strategy to deal with that is uh, rather than going with like no-go polygons and uh, uh, polylines, we can add in a 
polygon or polyline that we add a higher cost to. And that cost doesn't have to be a real cost. It could just be used as a, a penalty to deter the, the road from going uh, where you don't want it to. But if it really has to go there, um, it will. And it'll leave that extra cost. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, let's head back into the location module uh, for our next couple questions. So if uh, my road is not a constant width, uh, how do we create the corridor? So as we've only used one cross section in the example that we just went through. All right, um, so there's a, a bunch of different ways to tackle that one. We could have uh, different um, templates so we could create something that was wider uh, if we'd like. So, and with that we could create something new here um yeah sure I'll, I'll do it that way just i'll i'll show a few different ways to to tackle this so if we want to go in here we can i'll create it and i'm going to just leave it with that default name of xx0 but if it was a real project i'd probably change it and i'm going to say well we've got a 10 meter width and here again i'm not uh not going to uh, focus on making something really nice, uh, just something that's easy to see. So here we could say, well, from station uh, 400, I'm going to turn off my background so it's a little easier for folks to see. Uh, from 400 to 500, I'll add in that wider template. So that template is called that. We'll go 400. 500. Actually, we can apply it just to one side too if we like, just for the sake of doing something a little different here. Oh. <laughs> clicked, uh, clicked something and then uh, clicked back. All right. So we've got that in here. So we're running our default to 400. Four to 500, we've got that real wide road, and then uh, apply just on the left side, and then we've got 500 after that. So that's one way to tackle it. And we could add in what would be called a taper to smooth that out. Um, I'm going to get rid of that template that we have assigned. We could also, if it was just something like a pullout that we wanted to add in there, uh, that was a standard dimension that we wanted to reuse. We could do what would be called an override. So we'll go in, oops, go in here, we'll select the parameter we'd like to change. And we'll say, well, let's keep that default width at station 400. By station 410, we want to go to have a width of 10 meters. By station 450, We'll keep that 10 meter width and then we'll go back to 460 to our, our default. We can hit that that way and we'll see the, the bump out here. I really like doing it with the, the overrides as if it is a, a standard dimension. You can just say, well, I want to use that up the road a little ways at say station 500. And sorry, all sorts of misclicks. I want to have all of them selected. And uh, yeah, let's move that up to there. So I've just duplicated that whole pullout to move it up my alignment. And then the other way that uh, we could do it is if we had something that was really irregular shaped, we could reference a feature or another alignment to define the, the width. Um, so lots of different strategies to tackle this stuff. Uh, yeah, and what's easiest and most appropriate for your project will we'll just depend. But uh, yeah, it's all sorts of flexibility and all sorts of features that are easy to use. Okay, Matt, how are you for time? Okay for a couple yeah, more? Yeah, I can, I can go for a bit longer. Awesome. Um, the next couple questions are related to curves. So first question was, do you have an option for spiral curves? Um, so I can, if I wanted to make this a, a spiral, 
I, rather than assigning circle, I'll assign a spiral curve there. And we can see the start of transition and then the, the circular portion of the curve. So, yep. Awesome. Like the easy ones. Uh, yeah. Next question is, can I, is there a way to remove all of my curves in a specific range? Yep. Um, delete from and you can assign that station range. So that would just strip out the curves. Uh, if you wanted to delete all your IPs, so curves and the uh, well, uh, tangent intersection points um, accompanying them, we can go with the corridor delete range and then we could get rid of all points. And that's gonna, well, if we did it from start to end, we could delete the whole road. If we did it from just after the start to the end, we could, uh, well, basically uh, just straighten out everything in between. Uh, and then the other kind of may be obvious, may not be obvious. Uh, answer here is we can, uh, of course, grab those curves. So I've got that one. I can hit delete to get rid of the IP. So delete on my keyboard. Or we can just say, well, I don't want to apply cur a curve to that individual curve anymore. And I let go of the wrong one. There we go. Yeah. So again, pretty uh, easy peasy, straightforward. Lots of different, lots of different tools in there and ways to tackle them. Okay. Next question: uh, Can we annotate the? I believe it's the ground survey label and coordinate um, in on our alignment. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess there's all sorts of uh, different uh, spots that we could uh, do that. So uh, the the ground survey here, um, just where it's lidar data, uh, annotating every elevation point in that model would be well, it would be a bit of a mess. There's 2.6 million points being uh, modeled in there, so we won't. Uh, we won't label them all here, but it would be pretty normal to do that if we had uh, a conventional data set. And I'm not going to do it here just because it's going to be a mess since it's all LiDAR data, but we could come in here and we could turn on elevations for our ground survey if it was conventional data. Um, for uh, annotating the elevations of what we have going on here. Again, there's all sorts of different ways we can do it. So I showed the subsurface, uh, or sorry, sub window uh, label in the profile. We could add one of those that uh, represents the ground elevation. That's just a, another option. Um, we could create a label in our, our plan view. So we've got all sorts of labels here and we could create a, a user defined label in our, our plan view if we'd like. Um, and then we could add in uh, the same information in our cross section if we like. So other uh, tools for that, we've got banding, or we can just go in here and kind of add to the, the list of things here in our, our cross section. So let's uh, L1, whoops. Uh, I guess it's ground elevation. So wherever you decide to do it, there's all these different attributes you can pull from. So if I'm interested in my ground elevation, uh, we can pull that in. So I've got my ground elevation at center line and I've got my center line elevation showing up here. So uh, yeah, all sorts of different ways to do that. It, uh, yeah, just a matter of choosing which way you'd like to. Awesome. Let's do one more. Uh, last question, and then we'll, we'll follow up with the additional question askers kind of independently. Um, can we compare to path explorer paths in location? Sure. Uh, so let's see here. Now I did. All right. So I'm going to. Uh, and this is actually kind of a, a nice segue to, to talk about the way I didn't do it. So when I ran through the, the Path Explorer example, we we started entirely from scratch and we used that uh, Path Explorer feature when we uh, set up our file. So we can add Path Explorer features after the fact. So we're gonna, I'm gonna do it in my Project Explorer panel. 
So here we're going to add in a new horizontal alignment based off of a, a source. So we can select a couple different sources here. This one we want it to be uh, from terrain. So we're going to select our oops, file. So in this case, I switched the, the file over that I'm using. So I'm going to uh, reference an external file here. And let's add in this guy here. And we can do multiple at a time. So there we are. We've added in uh, two more uh, Path Explorer solutions to uh, what we have here. And uh, yeah, we could well, repeat that step of refining them to make them a little more uh, meaningful to evaluate here. So uh, for these, if I wanted to actually do a worthwhile comparison, well, I'm going to first run. Uh, smart curves, get that into being a, a proper horizontal alignment. I'm going to change my cross-section template to be the template that I'd like to use, and then I'm going to run my vertical optimization, and then that's where I'll have well, uh, something meaningful to compare rather than the polyline solution right now. So hopefully that covers that. Awesome. And with that, Thank you everyone for joining us today for our introductory webinar for rural road design uh, using RoadEng. We hope you found uh, both the workflows uh, beneficial. Uh, and if you have any other questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to our support team, uh, support.team at softry.com. Uh, we'd be happy to address them. Uh, for those folks who still had a question in the chat, uh, we will uh, yeah, follow up with an email here after the webinar. Thank you all again. Uh, thanks, Matt, and have an awesome rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, everyone.